leaked documents suggest Apple could be forced to build iPhones with user removable batteries in Europe. Good. It's because okay, it's it's on Mac rumors, so that's why it's singling out Apple and and iPhones, but really the European Union in general, they're mad at they're mad about the e-waste. Mm -hmm. They're mad about the smartphones, all these people using their smartphones. Uh-huh. They don't people don't know the EU've been around long before smartphones. They got the EU's got uh, wine and cheese, uh, bread, tremendous bread. They've got uh, euros. Automobiles, some of the some top top of the line automobiles. Mm -hmm. You understand? All the best soccer teams. You understand? Football teams. Yeah, it's great. They've been around, so they're sick of this e-waste. It's this. They say it's screwing up all those other things. Bicycles. Mm -hmm. They do that. Uh, October Fest. Uh, uh, accessible and affordable transit. <laughs> it's great. The EU. Fresh produce. Well, we have fresh. <laughs> hey, man! Come on now. You don't have you don't have EU level fresh produce. All right. So they're sick of the e waste. I remember seeing the thing. They were mad at the lightning port. They said, you know, we're thinking about forcing Apple out of that lightning port. That was the last time you heard about this. And Apple was like, too late because they're already done with that lightning port. They're moving on sometime soon, anyways, to Type C. But this one this is a bit tougher. It's a bit rougher, a bit more rugged because I don't see this. I mean, how are you going to do this? It's a proposal from the European Union suggesting that smartphone manufacturers in the EU should be forced to make all batteries removable in the future. Any smartphone brand that wants to sell a handheld device in the EU will have to ensure that every device on the market has a user removable battery. I mean, I'm kind of split on this. I, For the record, I mean, how are you going to do this? Is Apple really going to comply? Or are they going to go over there, you know, shake a few hands? Mm-hmm. Uh, Probably the latter. Shake a few hands? Yes. Mm. Eat a few meals. <clears throat> Eat some of that fresh produce. <laughs> hey, some of that fresh bread. Huh? Yeah. I mean, they might do that. Maybe not, though. Maybe they're mad. Maybe it depends how mad they are. It depends where the message came from. This is a leaked document. At the moment, it's not an official proposal. Many people, there's a whole community of people who say, I want to repair my stuff. I want to swap out my batteries. I don't want to get throttled when the battery's at half capacity. I don't want to wait in line. I don't want to talk to a genius. A lot of people think, hey, we should have some level of control over the lifespan of the device and what we can and, can re re can and can't replace. And some people go even a step further and they say, and it, they're actively trying to shut us down. And they're talking about Apple when they say that. Yeah. Now, look, I'm somewhere in the middle because here's the thing. I, I, I understand the compelling nature of the removable battery, but I also I look at the designs of these things. Man, I was playing with the S20 Ultra upstairs. They're man. sleek. Oh! Some, these designs are kind of... Everything is packed in there. Nice little package. So tight, and the tolerances are so minimal, and... This is coming from a guy, for the record. I don't need to go into the whole backstory again, do I? 27 years I spent replacing batteries. Yeah. I'm only 28. <laughs> I, spent, I spent five years. I spent five years with a business replacing batteries in iPhones, iPods, and so forth. It's not, man, it's not an easier and nice thing to do, but there was a demand for it at that point in time because the cost of those devices plus how quickly those batteries depleted. I, mean, I remember iPod mini, everybody needed a new battery in those things. They were, they were terrible for that. That was my gig. So I have a lot of, obviously 
I feel I like to have the ability to repair something, but but I just see increasingly the types of designs that we're asking for. It's hard. How do you? I mean, you look at the i the iPod Mini that you're you're showcasing here. At least you could get in there and crack it open. You look at these new designs. Everything's embedded. It's sleek. It's all packed in there, man. Like you gotta start heating up all the edges to, to remove the adhesives and. Everything is glass. There's no tolerance for that behavior. So we can't really, also we can't really turn around and say, yeah, user, go ahead, destroy your stuff. Uh -huh. When you're pretty convinced that the average user is not gonna have the tools necessary or the patience or the expertise to do it. So I'm split. I don't necessarily know that it should be mandated. Maybe it could be a little easier. Maybe they could somehow make it easier for those that really wanna dig in there. But I've been inside these phones, man, and it's just, it's not, it's hard to imagine what the suggestion would be because you got this battery wedged between this variety of other components. And it, it, in most cases, it's not feasible to ask the consumer to jump in there and replace their bat battery. And I don't see us going backwards to those to fatter plastic phones with doors on the back. You drop the phone, the whole thing explodes. Everybody remembers the days. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we're going to snap our fingers and go back to that reality. So this this proposal might be a little bit out of touch with the times. I think the ideal scenario is that these batteries, the improvements in battery technology, allow us to hold on to these things a little bit longer mm -hmm. and possibly chuck them out less frequently in exchange for a new one. Maybe that's a possibility. But even that's that's hard for me to talk about or think about as a tech fan myself. I'm always getting a fresh one. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, maybe accessibility within the community, wireless charging at kiosks and stuff like that, coffee what, shops. What are you going to do with that? You think you're going to extend the lifespan of the battery, battery conditioning? Not extend it, but just like have it charged. Oh, so if you're not holding a charge, yeah. it's like you can still keep using the phone? Yeah. That's nice of you, Mayor maybe, Will. you know. Mayor, Mayor will do, will, yeah. Yeah. Remember the campaign? You got rid of that one, the campaign background. Yeah, I know. I thought it was a bit ridiculous. I mean, too much that's what's me. good about it. It's good about it. Is it's ridiculous, obviously. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, it's it's a leak. It's a leak of a proposal. A leak of a proposal. I don't know where you guys land on this particular subject. Obviously, we don't go just tossing batteries into the incinerator nonstop. You know, Acme made. We don't want to go to that level either, but it's just it's a it's a hard one to figure out, hard one to map out, particularly with the disposal leasings. All this tech going forward, all the things we want. Well, yeah, you want the hot smartphone, you want the the watch, you want the headset, you want the well, you're you want them in the cars too. You want the cells in the cars oh, yeah, too. Yeah. What are you gonna do with all these batteries? Well, you 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 don't got a plan. No, you got no plan. It's collecting them. Yeah, so that's what, right so the EU is going to come get you. You're not even in the EU, and they're yeah. already mad at you. Got all these batteries piling up. It's but it's a, it's, a, it's a real question. The lifespan of these things, how long, replaceability, hold on to components. How long should you hold on to a smartphone, for real? Let's say you want to be on the, in the EU's good book. You want to be the environmental type. What do they recommend? How long you hold on to a smartphone for? Obviously, if you're into the replacing battery territory, that's like, oh, that's beyond, say, two years. Mm -hmm. You don't know the last time I held on to a smartphone for two years? Mm -hmm. it's, it's Never. Too long. I don't know if I ever did. No, back in the day, probably. But yeah, I'm just telling you, it's part of the, it's part of the gig here. So don't blame me. Right. I could probably live just fine on a Galaxy S8. I'd probably live my life. Yeah. But around here. I mean, there's six phones on the table right now. <laughs> Using so, all of them at the same time. Uh, yeah, that's right. What can I say? It's part of the gig. I can't. Uh... Anyway, where do you land, Will? What do you think? Um, I mean, yeah, yeah. a new phone every year. But I you mean, got I'm, new... I'm guilty of it. You're a new sure. phone every year. Yeah. Yeah. I it's, it's bad. Okay, let's ask people in the comments. How often are you get a new phone? How often do you think a human being should get a new phone? How long should you hold on to it? And is it an environmental reason or a cost reason? Let me know. Zoom photo showdown. Here we have an article from Android Police. They put the Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra up against the Google Pixel 4, and they looked specifically at Zoom. I thought this was interesting because of the fact that the Ultra 
S20 is talking a big game about the zoom capabilities, particularly this 100x periscope scenario. And the Pixel, on the other hand, is all in the software. It's, it's your, it's your, what does Ryan Whit, Whitwam says? Say, he says, the age old tale of software versus hardware. That's like a fairy tale for the future. Mm. The age old tale. Let me tell you something. The tech folk tale. It was a, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Once upon a time. Come hither. <laughs> Come. <laughs> the age old question of software versus hardware. I don't, I don't, I don't. You know. Is it an age old tale? Maybe, yeah. For the super nerds, it's an age old tale. We're all included because we fully understand it when we read it. But yeah, we talked a lot in the pixel days about some of the magic that was happening on the software end with the these various hybrid software. I mean, I don't even remember what the name of their Zoom was, but you just could keep zooming forever and it would it would resample and guess what's missing and put it back in. I mean, it was some real it was a real picture stew going on there. Mm. It's what they call it as the official Google terminology. Mm. And the S20, on the other hand, going more traditional. We're gonna give you, we're gonna give you more glass. Yeah. And we're awesome. gonna see how it works out. Now you go through this, uh, these samples. There's a number of samples in this particular article, and I gotta be honest with you, Will. It's not a slam dunk for the S20 Ultra. When I, when I first saw the headline, and of course I played around a little bit with both phones. I, I think to myself, yeah, probably the optical thing is gonna win, the the old good old fashioned glass, but. You go head to head, you look one and then the next, and you get a bit confused because there's certain elements you like from one and certain elements you like from the other. Having looked through the various examples, there's, uh, I believe, two outdoor shots and two indoor shots. What I can say is I think the S20 Ultra in most cases gives you the more detailed photo at tremendous zoom above 4X and into, into 8X territory, anything up to 10X. It gives you a little bit more detail and the edges look better. But I think in most cases for my eyeballs, the pixel photo g generally shows better contrast than color temperature. I don't know. Call me crazy. It's going to be a personal taste type of thing here. But I kind of think it's a bit unfair. Well, it's not unfair, but I think it's going to change because Samsung is probably still tweaking the software on how, on, on the processing that they're doing and on the color interpretation and auto auto color balance and stuff like this. This is a good comparison right here. So right there, you're looking at, what is that, the Pixel version? The Ultra. That's the Ultra, okay, give us the Pixel. You're zooming in big time here to try to... No, that's the Pixel. This is the Pixel. Yeah, that's the yeah. Pixel. The other one was the Ultra. So yeah. this is a good example. There's like these little faces on the on the sidewalk and this is an area where you start where you can fully appreciate the old technology the optical technology just straight up glass uh there's there's much less guesswork involved much less less software involved and that's the superior image to my eyeballs so it's a it's a weird article because what 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 comes into question here is is this more promotional for the pixel and the software side of things, or, or is it more promotional for what Samsung's been able to pack in the S20 Ultra? Because you're talking about an old phone, in the case of the Pixel 4, and you're talking about them using exclusively software. If they could do all that with software, what if they just packed a, another piece of glass in there and put that alongside software? This is the one, this is the picture indoors where I feel like I would probably take the Pixel 4 picture, and the person who writes the article seems to agree. And it's not, a photo and a good photo is not, solely about sharpness or detail. So it's also about contrast, it's about exposure, and when you pop off that photo color, whether you think it's good or not, and when you compare those two top to bottom, I think, well, I'll take the bottom one. I don't know about you, Will. I will too. Yeah. It's just more contrasted. It, it, and, and, and who knows why we select the things we do. It's all very subjective, obviously, and, and we're looking at it on a, on a web browser, and it's been compressed and uploaded and all the rest of it. So. Take it for what it is, but it is it is a really interesting contest between sort of the the premium software 
approach versus the premium hardware approach and where those two things overlap and where one succeeds and where one fails and so forth. The takeaway for me is I'm actually kind of surprised at how close the Pixel still is given the, the, the length of time it's been on the market and the fact that it doesn't have these hardware components baked in. That's kind of my takeaway. There's another example there in low light with the dog. Like which photo do you prefer there? Uh, the the pixel. Yeah, the, the dog has the, the right tones. Mm -hmm. The dog, ha you see the, the, the gradation there or the, the it's kind more of- more truer to life, I, I guess, the It's color. weird, man. It's weird. I felt this way about pixel performance for a while now. I don't know. I haven't used the pixel in a while. I'd like to see where they're at with the software right now. But I'm probably going to pop the SIM into the S21 first and play around with that. I, I do know for a fact, though, Samsung is still tweaking the software. So this could change over time. But it's kind of funny because even though you could argue that Samsung wins this particular showdown, it, it also kind of elevates the Pixel mm -hmm. in 2020, saying, hey, the Pixel 4 was capable of this. We almost got a Pixel 5 coming up now. So it's amazing what they can do. Now, you, now what you really wish is you could combine the two. The pixel processing. Hardware and software. The pixel processing with the Samsung hardware. Yeah. Now you're living the dream, Well, Now you can shoot the right photo of Otis, not this halfway stuff. Can you download Google Camera? I'm sure you could find a way. I'm sure you could get it. But there's so many, all the different cameras, would they all be supported? Yeah. Flipping between them? I don't know. Somebody's doing it right now as we speak. How about, okay, so you got the S20 in your pocket. Did you yeah. shoot any photos yet? Otis and whatnot? Yeah, quite a lot. And you came right from the pixel. Uh -huh. So why don't we just talk to you? I mean, I came from the Pixel Three. Still, still, you had you had it's heavy still, you had heavy hitting software on there. Yeah, it's still good. Um, I didn't really notice a lot, um, too much difference. They're mm. both really good. Mm. I almost feel like they're both too good. You know, there's just like uh, everything else is just nitpicking at this point. You're nitpicking. Yeah. And you'd rather not nitpick. No, no, no. they're good both great. All right, well done, Will. Uh, next up, we have the an AirPod holding Apple Watch band. And The Verge says it's either brilliant or incredibly dumb. So we're going to throw this question to the staff here. That's you, Will. That's you, Kirk. Is this fresh new Kickstarter brilliant or incredibly dumb? I'll give you a quick breakdown. It's an Apple Watch band with two little holders for your AirPods to fit in. When you're doing the things you might do with an Apple Watch and some AirPods, maybe you're working out. I don't know. Maybe you're out, you're going for a jog. I don't know what you're up to. Maybe you're just a person in the world at a given point in time. It's called the Air Band. And honestly, I was going to skip this article until I saw the name of the project's creator. Did anyone else see that right oh, there? Hold on. His name is Matt Youngblood. No. <laughs> no. But I'm saying, man. I'm saying, I was about to bounce right past this article, and then I saw that, and I said to myself, oh, baby, we're in business right now. <laughs> if, I get to say, if I get to say Matt Youngblood, and it's the guy's actual name, unbelievable. So shout out Matt Youngblood. Uh, he, I guess he, ha he has not met his goal yet. He has 41 days to go. We'll find out if, this is, if people think this is brilliant or not. Of course, the question that comes up immediately when you see this is, why don't you just pop them in the case? The case is so cool. The case does the charging. It just seems so natural to put them in the case. But Mr. Youngblood says, hey, man, you might not have a case near you sometimes. What are you doing placing them on the table? You're going to lose them. You, you throw them in the watch band. If the case is not near you, maybe the case is in the bag, the case is in the backpack, the case is in the purse. Hmm. Okay, so we got the video. We're playing the video. She helped the guy up. I don't know. They Help forgot the, the case up. at home. I don't know, man. I don't have all the answers here. Cool. All right. But you have a basic understanding now of how, how the thing operates. So are they running? Because they typically turn off when you put them into the, into the case. Right. And they're charging. Right. I'm worried about battery life when they're in the wrist. How long do they turn off? I guess they're turn always off? on. Right? Or, or, or maybe they turn off after a period of time when okay. there's no audio yeah. pumping. But... How long and they turn off when you take them out of your ears. Oh, okay. But I didn't think I can put AirPods over my ears to begin with. No, it's true. AirPods are a permanent fixture in people's ears anyway. Okay, so the question then 
It comes to you first, Willie Do. Is that AirPod holding Apple Watch Band? Is it brilliant or incredibly dumb? Uh, I could only see it in. Very you can't pick anything in between. You had to pick one or the other. <laughs> okay. I didn't. By the way, I didn't make the rules. The Verge made the rules. They're the ones that put the headline. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would go for brilliant. Yeah. I, I could see myself using this in very specific use cases. All right, Kirk, what do you got? Dumb. Whoa! He said incredibly dumb, by the way. All right. Uh, you know what? I can I can honestly see it either way, and that's why they put the headline the way that they did. No, you got to go one way. There's probably... Hey, that's not part of the game. <laughs> the, probably the better... Probably the better way... Is is for for some person out there, this is exactly what they want. Yeah. That yeah. person exists. It's definitely yeah. not me. That's not important. This this setup is not important to me at all. So for me, it's dumb. It's not something I would ever do. But I, I'm sure there is a person out there that works in a particular environment or has a particular lifestyle that needs something like this. So for them, it's brilliant. Yeah. But the question is how many of those people exist because well, I'm one of them. I well, would, I mean, he only raised he's only raised how much cash right now? He's Five raised grand. 5,000 bucks, man. He can't make this for 5,000 bucks. So, we'll what? see what happens if there's a lot of people like that, but uh, good luck to Matt Youngblood. Good luck. And you made it on the show, so we got a few people found out about it. Shout out. So, shout out, you know. Amazon opens it's first full-size grocery store with no cashier. So you remember the Amazon Go stuff? Remember the, one of the early episodes of this show where we were trying to talk about the sandwich, whether or not you yeah. got to look at a sandwich? It's called out. <laughs> what, yeah, you got to look at a I sandwich. I still believe in that. <laughs> you you well, believe in what? What side of it were you on? Well, looking at it and then just, you know, going, going about your day. You're talking about like a five second. Okay, right. Okay, thing, so you were you know? on the side that you just got to glance at your sandwich, and I yeah. like to. I have to look at my sandwich. Yeah. 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 Okay. 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 I recall now. <laughs> what a time! What a time that was. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so we were talking about the original Amazon Go stuff when it had the small little stores with no cashiers, and, and that seemed uh, impressive enough at the time. But of course, it's not enough. You know how Bezos is. Uh -huh can't just be having these little convenience stores. He went out and bought Whole Foods. He spent a bunch of money on Whole Foods. He can't have these little convenience stores. So he opens this, I think it's like 10,000 feet. Uh, bigger than that. 10,000? 10,400 square feet. In Seattle's Capitol Hill neighborhood, it will use cameras and sensors to detect which products customers pick off the shelves. And just it'll work in the same way as the Amazon Go stores that first opened. It's just way bigger. Those stores were typically around 2,000 square feet. They're working on another one that's got robots and stuff in it. Oh. And that one's going to be in Woodland Hills in the Los Angeles area. And that one, I believe, is going to be 20,000 square feet. So, look, some people are upset. She didn't even look at her sandwich at all, by the way. I know you just went well, back to the was clip a, from earlier. This was a... No, that's fine. Would that no? Because no, that's it's not fine. Don't get me fine. going on this again. It's not fine because he's already walking towards the cash. Examine the sandwich now. Don't oh, that start. That was a solid three, four seconds. I know, but he's already buying it. If he's moving in that direction, the inspection is to determine whether or not you want to buy it. Well, you don't have to stand there. And, and the way she grabs he's things is all wrong as well. I don't know who shot this commercial. Go to a supermarket, see how it works. People look at things, man. You smell it. Yeah, people look at things. Yeah. Anyway, so this is controversial because people say, hey, Jeff, you're killing jobs. They didn't mind when it was a 2,000-foot store because how many people work in a typical convenience store? One. Grocery store, you know, it's like 60 people, Will, uh -huh. inside a grocery store. So now you get all the robots and cameras and things like this. You start to go into every town. And it could be 24-7. Yeah, of course it's going to be. Of course it could be 24-7. Yeah. Okay. Jesus. Security guard at the front, maybe you got one guy in yeah. there. Or maybe you got a robot security guard. There you go. The front smacking, smacking people around. Yeah. Just wiping them right out. Oh, they could have the spot, is it? Some kind of Boston Dynamics. Get one of those Boston Dynamics. Uh -huh. No uh -huh. problem. So yeah, so some people are mad as they would be. Some people are, you mean some people are always mad. It does how it goes. And uh he says Bezos says you're all crazy, you're all nuts. There's still going to be employees in there. We need dozens of employees to stock the shelves still. We need, we need 
the employees. We need the robots. We need them all. We create jobs. He says, we created half a, half a million jobs. Amazon's created 500,000 jobs for people with all types of experience, education, and skill levels. Amazon jobs, including at Go stores, come with a great compensation and benefits, including a $15 minimum wage that is more than twice the national minimum wage. So, so Jeff doesn't, he, he not, he's not ready to take this heat. He's saying, hey, hey man, I made some jobs. How many jobs have you been making? Oh, well, that's what he said. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? And But he's always going to take the heat because these types of innovations, if you want to be on a fringe like that, you want to be putting stores like this together, of course you're going to gather, you're going to garner some attention from, from the groups that, that are employed in a similar fashion, particularly since the per he he has the purchase he, he made the purchase of uh, Whole Foods because now you say okay if this works really well at this Seattle store th they didn't call it it's not a Whole Foods they have a different name for it Amazon Go Grocery is that the name of okay all right Amazon Go Grocery is the name of it but if you plug in this technology to the Whole Foods brand now across the board pop 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 Right. And people, people that work at Whole Foods, they like working at Whole Foods. I'm not suggesting they're all finished. I'm not saying that by any means. There's a there's a there's a there's a human touch, particularly when you're spending a few dollars. Uh -huh. You might even want to talk to somebody at Whole Foods. You might you might even want to say, hey, what, what, what are you doing? What, what do you got for the coffee beans right now? What do you recommend? Yeah. You might want to say that. You might want to head to the deli counter and say. What you got going on? How's the broccoli doing? Yeah, Bezos robot isn't good at that yet. Yeah. Uh, Alexa? They'll smack you around. Yeah, exactly. Alexa connected to Boston Dynamics. That's not who I want at the deli counter. Yeah. Because I'll tell you, Will, and I told you in the past episode, I've been to the supermarket. Uh -huh. I walk around. I enjoy myself. So. <laughs> But I, I also have to say, there's something about the high-tech 10,000 foot, 20,000 foot. I go in there, no cash yeah. here, no lineup. There's something about that speaks to me as well. So it's two sides of the coin. It always is. Mm -hmm. Two sides of the coin. So you got to look at it both ways. It does feel like the future regardless. The United Food and Commercial Workers Union, they say this is designed to destroy millions of grocery worker jobs. Uh -oh. Well, that's what they say. I mean, Bezos doesn't say that. Amazon purchased Whole Foods for $13.7 billion in 2017. You think they just want to sell straight up groceries, Will? You think they're happy uh, with the pre-washed spinach? You think that gets Jeff going? No. Yeah. You think that gets Jeff going? Huh? You think he wakes up in the morning and says, let me check the pre-washed spinach we got on the shelf. No. What gets Jeff going is, what if we put 47 cameras in the pre-washed spinach aisle? Uh -huh. And I see what people are doing with that spinach. And I see how they're buying it, putting it back. I want to know. He said, what about, did they do the broad leaf, the thin leaf, the two leaf, the tree leaf? He's drooling. He's so into it. I mean, he's got to get to the bottom of it. Have you ever been on the website, Amazon? Also recommended, could be recommended. Customers who did what you do are also doing this. It's a whole streamlined process. They got to know about you, Will. Yeah. They want to know you, man. Well, they want to get to know you on that, a digital level. It's not enough to have a little convo. They want to know you deeper. Yeah. What's he been up to? Well, how good about luck last with that. week? I got many layers. How about two weeks ago? Yeah, like they're going to get to the bottom of it. Like an onion. You think you're safe? You're not safe. Yeah. Bezos is peeling me. Yeah, he's around the corner right now. Oh. That's right. Oh. About to get peeled. All right, last one for me. Stick it, stick into the food, futuristic food concepts. Panera Bread is launching a coffee subscription for $8.99 a month. So in an effort to uh, get people into the store on a frequent basis, they are launching a coffee and tea subscription. You pay $9 a month, unlimited. Huh. Unlimited. Yes. Uh, that got Kirk's attention. First, he was shaking his head no. Then he was like, wait a second. $9 a month. Because what do you spend at Starbucks right now? Did we figure this out recently? 200 <laughs> It's a lot more than 9 <laughs> oh, yeah. It's probably 50 uh, If you don't include well, you're mine. Well, getting, <laughs> you're getting loose. No, no, no. Don't include it's mine. Like don't include mine. 500 bucks. 
three three bucks. You're only doing one per day. Oh, okay. Because so the first one's at home. About fifty bucks. Fifty bucks. Yeah. So we were we were close. Yeah, you're way more than that. So. Yeah. Hey, man, that's separate. We're not including that. Just in the price comparison, Kirk is currently spending fifty dollars a month at Starbucks. You're gonna take a lot of heat for this. Right now. <laughs> But but I but I believe it. I mean, obviously we see it around here. I'm the same. I will be in the same department. It's it it adds up. You don't you spend three dollars at one time, you don't notice it, but it adds up. Uh, they're not the first ones to do this. Apparently, Burger King tried this out, and last year, and theirs was five bucks a month. But something tells me the Panera coffee is going to be a little better than the Burger King coffee. I'm just guessing. But of course, the goal here, Will, is they get you in for the coffee, and maybe you pick up something else. Mm -hmm while you're there because it becomes a habit. And honestly, I think it's a great idea. I'm just gonna say it straight away. Imagine, how does this work? You just tap your phone and you got free. I'm, my coffee consumption is gonna go through the roof though. Yes. Cause there's one right over there. It's actually quite dangerous. It's Maybe it's dangerous from that standpoint. Maybe I'll get some teas as well, mix it up. Panera Bread customers can soon drink as much coffee and tea as they want for $8.99 per month. The subscription program launched launching on Thursday. Is that today? It launches today. Comes as the chain overhauls its breakfast and coffee offering. So they got new iced coffee. Oh, wow. Iced coffee and hot tea will be included in the program as well. Hmm. Anyway, so they revamped the menu. They come with the new promo. And they said that in the past... Customers, subscribers' monthly visits in test markets increased from about four to more than 10 visits per month, and food sales increased 70% with those customers. Huh. So it makes sense. There it, has to be a limit, though, per day. No, there's no limit, man. Per day? Yeah, but how much coffee can you drink, Will? Well, I mean, you can get coffee for Kirk. You can get coffee for Jack. Oh, no, no, no. It's only my coffee for me. I, I know, I, but you keep on coming back. That's what I'm saying. You know? No, I mean, if you're, if, you're, if you're trying to hack it, then, yeah. then, then you might run into some issues. But I would assume if there's enough window of time, sure. Right? Because you just have to figure out what would a, the max consumption habit be. I think you could get a coffee every two hours. Right? No one yeah. can stop you from a coffee every two hours. Some people do it. You, I'm not saying I don't drink a coffee every two hours. People look at the desk. They think I drink a coffee every Man. five minutes. I probably have three coffees in a day. We talked about this earlier today. I have three coffees in a day, maybe two. And But this, I mean, $8.99 for a whole month. Yeah. It's a, it's a steal of a deal. Now, it I got to be yeah. honest. I never actually tried Panera's coffee. So I don't even know what I'm working with. Huh. I got to check it out and see how it goes. But I, after this article, I'm going to go check it out. With some pastries. I I, I'm going to check it out. After this article, I'm going to check it out. Now, I don't know if this subscription is going to be offered in Canada or just the U.S. Probably, maybe, probably just the U.S. But nonetheless, I just want to give Panera Coffee a taste to see what they're working with. And and I think it's a it's a cool little marketing. You reward the most loyal customers. I, I, I like those types of promos. People who are there often. But I will say... One potential side effect, if it's too successful, it could be lineups with people right. just loading up on the coffee all day. Right. You're like, hey, you were here before. and It's a whole social group. You see each other uh -huh. drinking all this coffee. Anyway, nonetheless, interesting, interesting marketing. Everybody wants a piece of that Starbucks dollar, and it's tough to pull guys like Kirk away. Mm -hmm. He's 50 a month, this guy. Unbelievable type of lifestyle over here. Yeah. Unbelievable. Anyway, I'll go. I'm going to go. Let's go to Panera. Yeah.